it's one week of my life that turned into the most important thing I ever did. It was all about the joy of discovery and exploration. I thought, wow, this really relates to people. Curious by nature, creative by default, responsible for technology breakthroughs, unknown. Some people really deserve more credit. There are fascinating people behind the innovations that revolutionized our lives. Computer scientists, internet architects, programmers, digital designers. They don't usually get a lot of time in the spotlight. It's the billionaire CEOs that get all the attention. It's high time we paid tribute to those software pioneers. This year, we present to you eight stories of hidden heroes who dared to think big, but gained little credit. Some ideas never really took off as a business, but they paved the way for the future. And today, we're living in that future. We need to pay our respects to the heroes behind those ideas. Get ready for a new story each month, written by Stephen Johnson and brought to you by NetGuru. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Jinta. I lead the innovation consultancy here at NetGuru. I would firstly like to thank all of you for joining us um, as we continue this Hidden Hero series. And today we have a very special hero joining us. A web pioneer, a founding um, engineer at Netscape, and the author of numerous important contributions to the web that have since become second nature to all of us. Uh, he programmed one of the very first hypertext browsers, Lint, which is the oldest web browser still being maintained. And in addition, he has taken the lead on several important additions to the HTML standard. Today, he is mostly known for the invention of the web cookie, that snippet of code that introduced a new way of sharing identity on the web. As Stephen Johnson puts it in the story written within the Hidden Hero series, Monturi's cookie was a cure for web's amnesia. It gave the medium a sense of memory without compromising privacy. But like most important technological breakthroughs, the cookie turned out to trigger a few long-term consequences that have had a monumentous uh, impact on the world. Variations of that code are almost certainly installed on all of our computers today, and billions of dollars of advertising revenue depend on it. And what a perfect place for me to introduce our hidden hero for today. Welcome, Lou Montuli. Hey now, how are you, Ginger? I'm good, Lou. So I like to start off these um, conversations all the same way. How are you doing today? I am really good. And I'd just like to tell you, your backstage green room is amazing. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> it's my first time in this room, so I'm, I'm also very excited about this. Nice, nice. This is this is great. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to uh, tell you whatever I can and uh, you know, make your audience have an entertaining, hopefully humorous times as well. So let's have a good time and, and, and cover as much as we can. Fantastic, Lou. So at this point, I just want to remind our audience that please feel free to ask your questions as we go along. If there's anything that Lou and I don't discuss that you need answers to, feel free to reach out and we will get to those um, at some point during this interview. Um, Lou, I'm going to jump straight into the questions right now, right? Um, so I like to start at the beginning. What did it look like to be online in the early days of the web before the first browsers had even made it mainstream? So it would depend on where uh, where you were organizationally. So I was a student at a uh, uh, a large public university, and uh, universities were one of the few organizations that were on the early internet back in in those days. So I uh, got to college in 1988. And uh, I started working at the University Computer Center around uh, 1990. And that's when I discovered there's, well, there's a network here. Because as a, as a regular student, you probably wouldn't have noticed it because there wasn't anything like email or you know, there was certainly no web browsers, nothing that made it easy to, to navigate the network. And so my university, which was the University of Kansas in, in Kansas, obviously, uh, was part of a network called MidNet. Uh, which was a, a collection of Midwestern colleges 
uh, in the Midwestern United States. And then that connected by a, um, you know, it was called the ARPANET back in those days, which was uh, the internet was really ARPANET, which was, uh, it came out of a DARPA grant, which was the United States defense grant budget. Um, and we were connected to all these other universities and a few uh, corporations like Intel Corporation and others that were on the network, but very few actual commercial organizations were on the net at that time. And so there's this loose collection of colleges and businesses, and they were all interconnected by basically the same protocols that we have today, i.e. IP, uh, Internet Protocol. Uh, but there were very few services that actually let you do anything. So there was a very primitive email. Uh, there was a very primitive uh, kind of um, bulletin board system called Usenet. Um, there was a file uh, ability to get files off the Internet called FTP. Uh, and there was a few other kind of experimental ways of getting things. There was um, one especially that was brand new in, um, in the late 80s and early 90s called Gopher, uh, which was one of the first easy to use uh, methods for navigating computers that were on the remote internet. And it allowed you to kind of very, you know, in a primitive way, kind of navigate to another computer and see either a text document or grab a file. Um, so um, so uh, a lot of those innovations in the late 80s and 90s seemed to start at universities um, rather than business. So why, why was that? Well, at the time, there wasn't much business to be had on the Internet. There, there weren't any consumers on the Internet in, a, in the way that we think of them today. There were, um, they were mostly just technical people, who, which were, the, you know, for the most part, the people who had access to computers that were connected to the Internet were people at universities, which were, and, and those people were mostly the technical folks because uh, students and faculty didn't really have easy access to those computers in most cases. And the businesses didn't really have anything to sell or, or buy on the Internet. So there was very little commercial um, uh, or revenue opportunity on the Internet, and therefore companies were not investing anything. And that, that is also typical of many new technologies, uh, which is why... Uh, when you're looking at long-term investment in in um, in technologies that take a long time to develop, it is often the case that governments or or research institutions that are charities or otherwise uh, focused on long-term innovation are the ones who uh, who fund these this research, and the uh, the technology kind of evolves from those government or charity researches uh, uh, research groups, and then eventually makes it into the open market. So then uh, during your time at, at the University of Kansas as a student, I'm sure there was lots of distractions. What kind of started your journey um, into this space? Yeah, so I, uh, I got a job at the computer center because I needed to make some money. Um, the, the, the college back in those days was a much more affordable endeavor. So you could, you could realistically work a part-time job and pay for, pay for school. So my school was about $600 a semester for tuition back then, which is, if you compare now, it's about fifteen thousand uh, dollars a semester. So a big, huge increase in cost, which is very unfortunate. Uh, uh, so I, I I got a job to try to pay for college, uh, and I was successfully doing that. And I decided that working in the computer center would be way better than working at, at like food service or something like that. And it, it did turn out to be the case. So I started out working like third shift, uh, running these big printers that uh, that made uh, all the the syllabus and stuff for the school. And also we had those big round reel tapes, which were, which were, uh, you might see in like a movie like Dr. Shivago or something, uh, uh, where, um, very old school systems from the seventies, we, our universities often didn't have the budget to upgrade. So we, we had these very old, uh, tech systems there. Um, and I would be changing tapes on a regular basis and I got, ended up getting really bored doing that. And I said, well, how do I, how do I get out of this running printers and changing tapes things in the third shift? And so I uh, was able to convince uh, the, the folks who were running the support desk that I, that I knew something about computers, even though I, I really didn't. So it was more of a, a fake it till you make it kind of moment. Um, and I got a job at the, um, the support desk, which is, you know, uh, helping people with their computer problems. And mostly I just had to go figure it out as, as the problems came to me. And then eventually I got bored doing that. And that's when the idea to create uh, links came, came up. So how do you make it from this idea of um, 
doing something better than what you were doing before into I see an opportunity, right? I have yeah. a passion now and I really want to dive deeper here. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question because um, this is one that, um, you know, where does innovation come from and what's the spark? Um, and I do think that the sparks are all around us. It's just whether or not you take the time to go reach out and, and do it. So in this case, the spark was I saw a program called HyperRes, which was a um, a desktop only um, hypertext client. And what it what it did is it it showed uh, uh, you started up and it would show you a hypertext uh, it, would, it would show you a document with hypertext links in it, and then you could um, you could basically click on the links and it would take you to a new document. So it's hypertext is is the foundation of the web as we know it today, and everyone knows how that works. But back then, it's like oh wow, this is this is really new and interesting. We've we've never actually seen this before because back in those days, you could imagine, you know, most things were like when you, you know, when you call somebody, it says press one for <laughs> you want to talk to sales, press two if you want to talk to maintenance. That's what how computer programs would work is like you would you would see a menu and you'd press one to go down there or you'd press two, and so uh, hypertext was a much more natural way of navigating um, documents uh, documents and. Um, in, in that particular program, it was just a document browser, and it was just on a local computer. Um, but uh, if you remember, I mentioned this program called Gopher that was um, popular at the time. It allowed you to navigate the computers uh, spread up all across the internet. And it worked in the way that I just described. It, you would see a menu of 1 through 10, and you, it would say, well, would you like to, would you like to go to you know, the University of Arkansas? And you'd press one, <laughs> and in, in, in there it would say, "Well, would you like to go here?" And you you press three, and that's how it worked. And and so it was very you know a hierarchical menu driven, which was it, it was adequate for the for the purpose, but it wasn't very um, it wasn't very engaging. It didn't it didn't speak to the way that humans really want to um, to uh, ingest data. Hypertext um, is allows you to create um, uh, you know, in, an infinite level of customization and have, you know, partic in particular, every word could be a, a link to somewhere else. Um, and you could do menus if you wanted to. You could do all these other things. So it was a much more flexible format for display of information. Um, and so that that spark of innovation that I had was when I saw um, HyperRes and I knew about Gopher, I said, well, what if what if I just took the two and I put them together like peanut butter and chocolate? Maybe I'd have that great Reese's experience. I mean, it's a good combination. I've got to be honest, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and um, there was also something going on in the back of my mind is, okay, so I'm working this computer desk job. Uh, we're helping people and it gets old after a while. People, you know, once you learn all the questions, it's like, oh yeah, you just stick the, di stick the floppy disk in, you type this command. So you get kind of, I got bored about the, these things. It's just a common theme in my life. I get, I, I get uh, a little bored and I have to go do something else. And so I'm constantly looking for interesting things to, uh, to do. Um, I was, <clears throat> I was, uh, I had helped install a new email system at the university at, and it was called, uh, it was called Elm and it was a user, user interface to, uh, you know, really primitive early, uh, email and Elm, uh, whenever you exited Elm, the author's name came up at the bottom. And I asked somebody, I was, well, what's this, what's this name? And, and the person told me, well, this is open source software. This person writes the software and just releases it on the internet and uh, makes, it, makes that software available for anyone to use. And now we, our university is able to use it and it's a better program than most. And I thought to myself, wow, if I could write open source software, then people would know who I am and I'd be able to get a job. <laughs> also like, so there well, was a plan, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, there's a, there was, you know, it was forming, right? I was like, I was not, I, just to be honest, I was not a very good student. I, I you know, my ADD or whatever I, I call it, uh, where I'm, I get distracted easily and I just want to go, I want to go work on the thing that's really interesting to me, does not align well to a traditional student um, discipline where you're supposed to go through the book all, you know, in order and do all your homework. So I was, you know, I was a terrible student. Uh, it was, you know, I, I never did graduate. I ended up leaving the university that, go pursue web browsers, uh, thank, but thank God, because you know, if you looked at my GPA, you'd think I'm a, I'm a complete idiot. Uh, so that was, the, that was the spark of innovation moment. I'll, I'll, I'll 
give the floor back to you before I keep talking. <laughs> cool. So, um, Lou, we've spoken a bit about the kind of limitations of the first web browsers, right? Um, is there anything that we've missed? Because the main question I want to ask you right now is, how did this feel browsing the web back in those days? Yeah, so the web um, in those days was very different. It was very much just um, browsing documents. Uh, so um, if you can imagine the web with no JavaScript and no images even, <laughs> it's just text documents that link to other text documents. And then the, eventually those documents could get you to a, a file. So you could like download a new program for your computer or you could download source code and compile the program. Um, and you could get you could get to images. Um, uh, you could even get to videos, but uh, the bandwidth back in those days, even between universities, was so tiny. Like it, it would be uh, if if a university had a one megabit interconnect to the other universities, that was actually pretty big. And then they eventually up. So like it was a T one back in those days between universities, and then they eventually upgraded T threes, which were. Uh, I don't know, like eight, eight or ten megabits, uh, but very slow, and that's for the entire university. So, you know, university of thirty thousand people over one megabit link. So there wasn't a lot of video going on. Uh, so you can just imagine it was uh, it, in the early web. It was just about getting to information, documents, that sort of thing. Links was the very first browser to um, to implement forms, which allowed the user, i.e., the, me or you, to who, who, using the browser to input information and then have that sent to the server and have some you know, response. Um, and that's part of you know, really the, the web 2.0, which was uh, there um, when, when we tried to add all these features to make uh, applications run on the web. So anything, anything that you could do with a computer application, we tried to make it possible to do that uh, in a web application. So, so Lynn's and um, the introduction of forms was one of the kind of first attempts to solve this kind of standalone entity problem that was occurring, right? Were there any other efforts that were being made either in different places around the globe or within the US itself at, at the time? Yeah, so um, the, the development of the web was very much distributed. So uh, we go back in history a little bit. Uh, uh, in, you know, I had this innovation to take hyperres and Gopher and mix them together to create a browser, but it wasn't a World Wide Web browser because World Wide Web is actually this you know, very specific standard developed at CERN by uh, Sir uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, and he did his work. Um, I'm pretty sure he was he predated uh, me. I just had no idea that he existed or his project existed. Uh, so I was working kind of in parallel on a hypertext browser. Um, and then um, uh, at uh, the NCSA at the University of Illinois, uh, uh, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina started working on a project called Mosaic, which took the World Wide Web standards, i.e. HTML and HTTP, and created a web browser called Mo Mosaic. Um, and I ended up seeing the web by finding Mosaic, because when Mosaic was first announced in, I think this is December of, 92, and I, maybe it's 91, 92, I don't remember. I don't have all that dates in front of me. Um, I saw Mosaic and, and realized, hey, this is essentially, this is doing the same thing as Lynx. Um, it's just using a different set of uh, protocols and uh, standards for layout. And it works on different types of computers. So Lynx works on um, Unix and uh, VAX computers, and it's specifically designed to work on text terminals uh, that are, were very common in those days. Uh, uh, Mosaic worked on X Windows machines, which is again, uh, another type of Unix machine, but it was a graphical user interface. Um, and uh, and uh, the, the information browser is only as useful as the number of people who can use it, right? And um, you, have to create, you have to create different versions of the program for every different operating system that you're gonna have. So there, back in those days, there was Macintosh, it was, Looked looked a lot different than Macs today. Uh, there was there there was PCs, and that either ran DOS or Windows 3.1, which was like the the first version of Windows that actually took off. Um, and there were you know a few other computer types, and eventually you have to create versions of your software for every single one of those computers. And I knew I for Lynx I had needed to start working on. It. I was actually working on the X Windows version when I found 
mosaic. But I quickly realized that it, we would be a stronger community if we just worked together. So I made links compatible with the web and it became, at that point, it became a true World Wide Web browser. Um, and then um, over time, other people started to work on a Windows version and a Mac version and other versions of, of web browsers. And it's it, it was really then that the web started to really gain in momentum because at that point, once there was a, a, a browser for every type of computer that you could use, all these different people could come in and join in the fun. <laughs> and and as you as you add as you add consumers, i.e., people who are going to consume that information, the, the the content creators want to create more and more content. And how yeah. how did you guys see each other? Did you see your yourselves as like a collective or as competition? Very much a collective, yeah, uh, because um, we were all working on different, slightly different versions, but we recognized that the, I don't know that we could have um, expressed it in, in such a clear way, but a rising tide lifts all boats, right? So we strongly believed that the web and especially open standards around the web, so a web entirely owned by uh, and for the people so that no one could ever commercially take it and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and you know, take their ball and go home, essentially. Um, we, we thought this was very important. And the networks that were, um, the commercial networks that were existing at the time was uh, mostly AOL, which was a pay to play network. So you had to pay AOL to log onto their service. Hold on just a moment. Let me get a drink. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so AOL, did they see themselves as part of the collective? So it sounds like they wouldn't so much, though. <laughs> no, the AOL was definitely not interested in seeing the web uh, succeed. And, you know, it wasn't until uh, the my, uh, me and the uh, other students from University of Illinois joined together to create Netscape that it really even became an issue because prior to this, we were just... As students working in the, in, the, in the dark recesses of, of universities, uh, and um, it wasn't it it hadn't really taken off yet. We were talking about tens of thousands of people in the early days, but it was started to build somewhat exponentially. And by uh, by 1994, there were definitely millions of people who had accessed the web before. Maybe it, probably very small number of millions of people, but. Um, these tools that we had created was were giving incentive for universities and companies to actually uh, allow their users to get onto the internet, and simultaneously that the technology was building to uh, allow more bandwidth. So I was just wondering, like, as someone who was around in the '90s and very well, I remember it, right? <laughs> um, the kind of di digital acceleration from the 90s to the early 2000s was pretty insane. And do you think because of your efforts of acting as a collective, we were able to see that acceleration? So, that, sorry, that yeah. idea of sharing knowledge, um, sh sharing skills, etc. Yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's several things. So this idea of open source and open standards is a really, really important one because it, it incents people to work together collaboratively um, it, when when a single corporation creates a proprietary network um, they are highly motivated to make that network popular but they're also highly motivated to keep um, keep gates on it because they want to they want to monetize it in the long run and so uh, when you're not really concerned about monetization efforts, <laughs> you're, you can you can just explore whatever is the best thing for the product. And usually, the best thing for the product is you listen to your users and you figure out what do they really want. And there's in 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 the web case, there's two different types of users. There's the there's the consumers who use the browsers who want content, and then there are the content creators who are creating content for the web, and they want to create more and interesting content. And how did you go about talking to these groups? Um, I'm, I'm assuming, tell me if I'm wrong, being on a, a university campus helped to get this ball rolling. Yeah, so I was fortunate that at my university, we 
we had an outstanding project where they wanted to create a campus-wide information system. Uh, that's what they called it back in those days. But what they really wanted to create was a website, <laughs> and they wanted to get um, they wanted to get all the stuff that you would expect to see on a website today about a university. So student uh, students want to know you know when their classes are. Ideally, they'd love to sign up for these classes and do everything on the web. But that was you know that was. That was really possible back in those days. <laughs> so mostly, we just wanted to get all the all the information that um, you have to put in a book these days. Like you think about uh, back in the day, you used to get a phone book, this giant thing, and you'd look up everybody's number. Uh, well, a university has you know hundreds, if not thousands, of regulations and office hours and all these things. And they just wanted to get this online so students had better access to it and you know, faculty and everybody. So the the project that I actually built links for was for that project. And we, uh, it, within the university, because we had a very specific problem, we uh, really uh, touched on a lot of the, a lot of the same issues that the web would experience over many years in the future. So we, uh, for instance, wanted to do complex searches on calendars and things like that, which was actually led to the creation of forums. But we could have done it by creating scripting languages within the browser. We could have done it by creating plugins or some other mechanism within the browser. And we discussed all those things and realized that forums was the easiest method to, to do this. But uh, within three years, from that point, we ended up going at Netscape, building all those other th methods, building a scripting language, building embedded plugins, uh, adding Java to the, the product so you could actually build products within the product, all those things. So um, it, at first, I was just listening to the folks at the university. And then we we were we created a good enough program that other universities wanted to use it. And so I would listen to I would listen to emails that I would got to get from administrators from other universities. And then I would just talk to people who were using the browser. The great thing about building a product that one wants to use themselves is that you get to dog food it. And that's just using it yourself and making it better based on your own feedback. And many of the features in Lynx were just me using the product and uh, and saying, oh, gosh, I wish this was, I wish I could do this. It would just make things easier. And so that's, that's what I would do. So staying on the same track what or how did you come up with the um the idea or what was the problem you were trying to solve um with the cookie itself yeah great uh great segue <laughs> uh so uh, the, the the cookie is an important innovation and it's okay if uh if people are listening to boo at this point uh <laughs> usually usually in the live audience situation that's where we get the boo. 50 50 I assume, right? <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly so uh, yeah, the, the cookie uh, uh, w was solving a, a very important problem, and it still s solves important problems today, but it is also implicated in, in, in some of the uh, misuse uh, scenarios that advertising uh, brings. It's that uh, the, the web, uh, the basic web protocols, which is HTTP, is, uh, is stateless. So when you request a document or anything from a web server, the browser just connects grabs the grabs the document and and returns hold on a second my so until lou is back <laughs> sorry i just <laughs> pulled i pulled everything ah. no worries lou <laughs> So to be honest to the audience and to Lou while he's listening, um, when I was promised to talk about cookies today, I did envision the cookie monster and I was very excited. And there are <laughs> elements of booing the enemy um, over the digital cookie that we are discussing right now. Lost my camera, huh? Hold on just a second. I think I, I tried to stand up too fast. I pulled the microphone out. I pulled the headphones out and I lost my, <laughs> lost my uh, camera. Let's see if it comes back here uh nope uh, okay let me try see now we get to test to see how good i am at uh technical it's uh, a throwback to your yeah. university days right <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> let's see where are the settings on this program okay i think uh no that's the wrong one so we have momentarily lost lou i'm sure he will be back in a moment 
Um, until then, I will have a quick look at any questions and try and um, place them for the audience. It's one week of my life that turned into the most important thing I ever did. It was all about the joy of discovery and exploration. I thought, wow, this really relates to people. Curious by nature, creative by default, responsible for technology breakthroughs, unknown. Some people really deserve more credit. There are fascinating people behind the innovations that revolutionized our lives. Computer scientists, internet architects, programmers, digital designers. They don't usually get a lot of time in the spotlight. It's the billionaire CEOs that get all the attention. It's high time we paid tribute to those software pioneers. This year, we present to you eight stories of hidden heroes who dared to think big, but gained little credit. Some ideas never really took off as a business, but they paved the way for the future. And today, we're living in that future. We need to pay our respects to the heroes behind those ideas. Get ready for a new story each month, written by Stephen Johnson and brought to you by NetGuru. 
Hi, everyone. Welcome back to part two. We decided to have, to have a quick ad break, all the talk about cookies um, got us salivating. So, Lou, welcome back, and well done on solving your technical <laughs> Yeah. Gosh, I had to do a full reboot there. I'm not sure what happened. Something uh, something just went crazy. I, I stood up because the dog was uh, starting to bark, and then I simultaneously <laughs> pulled the microphone the headphones out, and then the camera went wacky, and then when I plugged the camera out and back in, the, uh, the whole... Uh, the whole stream yard crashed. <laughs> I, I, I just love the timing of it. Like we, we get to cookies and you're like, I've, I've had enough of defending these. That wasn't my plan. I'm out. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, I guess I guess it could be seen through that lens. So, uh, yeah, apologies. Uh, but uh, that was not uh, that was not the intended uh, the, uh, result. But uh, yeah, let's get to cookies. So, um, yeah, so the, the cookies were trying to solve the problem of um, that, that there was no memory between requests. So when you go when you go to a site uh, using HTTP, which is the protocol of the web, um, the your browser connects, grabs a document, and then disconnects. And then when it wants the next document, it connects and disconnects. And there's there's nothing there that identifies the browser in any way, so that the 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 website would know that the person getting document A and document B is the same browser. And if you're just if you're just getting disconnected content, it doesn't matter. And that's what the way the web was initially. You're just grabbing content to read, and therefore it doesn't really matter what the server thinks. But if you want to do more complex applications, and a, a good example of this is a shopping cart on a shopping site. If you want to express to the to the site that you're interested in buying something, like um, you want to buy some blue suede shoes, for instance, you you know, your typical thing would be to press a button and say, add to my cart, and then it would be in your cart. And you can continue to navigate around the site and add you know, some, you know, some fancy red shoelaces or something before you check out. Well, in the old days of the web, there was no way to hold that state. <clears throat> and that we had tried some different, um, different experiments by adding it to the URL or some other ways, but it just didn't work seamlessly. So the cookie was designed to do two things one it was designed to add state to a particular website so you could create shopping carts and many other applications from it and two it was designed to try to preserve your um your anonym anonymity across many other websites so the cookie is designed to only be shared um back to the website that you are visiting and then when you go to a different website that different website doesn't have access to your cookies from the other website um and so it was a it was a a mechanism specifically designed to add state to websites, but also preserve your privacy across the web, which so, is which is ironic because we'll get to the other parts. <laughs> we will definitely get to that. Um, but before we do, um, so you kind of identified a problem, right? Or more so a solution, but what was the spark in this case? What was the, this is not how it should be and I could fix it. Yeah, so we we had been kicking around a bunch of ideas for a long time because this was a problem that we had identified and known about for years. And then uh, when I was at, uh, it was within the first three months at Netscape, um, we were rebuilding the browser from scratch and trying to tackle a lot of problems that had been left because they were hard problems or <laughs> or just not motivated to to work on them. Um, and uh, Netscape had an initiative, uh, a different part of the company wanted to build uh, software to help enable commerce because um, the idea behind uh, Netscape's founding is we were going to build these web browsers, essentially give them away for free. And then we were going to build um, we were going to build software for businesses to help um, create um, you know, uh, commerce and security and other things on the web. We were going to sell those servers to businesses. Um, and one of the servers that we wanted to build was a, 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 a server that allowed you to purchase things on the web. It's very ubiquitous today, but there was no way to purchase anything on the web back in those days because it lacked security. It, it lacked the, you know, the fundamental things like being able to build a shopping cart, these other things. And so we were trying to solve all these problems. We built HTTPS, which is you know, secure HTTP to solve the security side of things. And we needed to build these shopping carts. So that was... That was the impetus is like, oh, we really need to go solve this. And then it took 
it took some time and it took a innovative spark to come up with this idea of, of the cookie because the other proposals that had been made to bring state to the web uh, had this problem where other websites could it could leak information to other websites and we didn't want that we didn't want to create a tracking mechanism that allowed you to be tracked across websites so we were specifically trying to avoid that which again we'll get to the ironic part about that so that's a lovely segue into my next question so um <laughs> i suppose today cookies do raise a lot of issues regarding user privacy right um but the cookies themselves they didn't create the software vulnerability to give access to users private data um the cookie that was designed to give this better experience the, the one that you designed to um yeah it so then became used by advertising companies right to track online behavior serve um, and to serve targeted ads how was that possible how were they able to do that yeah so it, that's the irony i was speaking of is that cookies became the most um visible means of which tracking then became enabled and the way uh, ad trackers work is they use a, a combination of technologies within the web to and cookies are part of that combination to um, to track users across multiple sites and it's relatively complicated which is why we didn't think of this particular use case as we were vetting cookies because we did spend uh, after we came up with the initial concept we spent uh, a bunch of time thinking about ways in which um, it it could be made better, or which ways in which it could be exploited, et cetera, et cetera. And this this particular scenario didn't uh, didn't come to mind. So, the way ad tracking works today is that uh, first first off, and most importantly, is many sites need to collaborate together in order to create an ad tracking network. So, um, a single company can do can't use cookies to to track people across the web. It's only through collaboration with all the other websites that it can be done. So you take an advertising network like DoubleClick, which was the first to actually exploit this. And what they did is they uh, worked with um, about 100 different sites on the internet and convinced them all to put a particular image on their website or uh, an advertising image. And those images were all being served from the DoubleClick website. Um, and so across these hundred different websites, they were all pointing back to DoubleClick. And then um, the DoubleClick used a combination of cookies and this uh, concept of a refer field, which is a, you know, a, 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 some metadata within the HTTP request. And this, this, um, this other concept in which the web browser, when you go to a, a a particular site, let's say you go to yahoo.com, Yahoo will have images within it. And most of those images are loaded from Yahoo as well, but it can also point to an image that lives anywhere. Like it can point to doubleclick.com. And so when, when you make a request to your website, the, the URL that has the host name in it, that's called a first party request. And then if an image is embedded in the page that's returned, that points to another site that's called a third party uh, request. And it's cookies within these third party requests that, um, that kind of allow this, this technological interchange that allows you the, the, the advertising site to see whether or not you've seen the same image at multiple sites. And, and therefore you can infer that that same browser has been to all these other sites. So that's a way of tracking. Um, now, again, it's just, it's your browser, it's not you, it's not giving away your social security number or anything that you didn't intend to give it. What it is doing is that cookie interchange to the third party service can see that, you know, you were at Yahoo, you were at ESPN, uh, you know, you were at these other sites because I collaborated with all these sites. Um, so that that's, um, you may see uh, the reference to third-party cookies. That's what it means. It's 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 a it's a reference to a site that you didn't visit, uh, where that cookie or image is being served by a, a, another uh, another service. And it's that it's that scenario that allows uh, tracking. Um, uh, but it is also that scenario that allows advertising to be uh, ten or twenty times more uh, more effective, i.e. And, and in the end profitable, that it really allowed um, content creators to monetize their content in a way that made sense. So um, it, that's why 
uh, when when we found out that this was a this was a a problem because cookies were designed not to allow any tracking at all. When we found out in about 1996 that um, this 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 type of of um, leak uh, was occurring, we had a very difficult decision to make as a company because the web was still young back in those days and it had very little revenue coming in. There was yeah, Amazon didn't even exist, I think, at that time. So there was very little commerce going on. And the only thing that uh, the, the major revenue source for the web was advertising. And so if we completely remove the third party cookie, which was certainly technically possible, and that's what many of the proposals do today, um, then it would uh, severely diminish the ability for advertising to work on the web. So. Uh, what we decided to do instead of completely turning the third-party cookie off is to make it really obvious that these things are are happening. And, and so, then, yeah. Um, sorry, please. Sorry. Well, uh, we created a bunch of tools within the browser to control cookies, to make sure you know that they're there, to clear them. To you can even set up automated schedules. So we created uh, we uh, we created um, user controls that they can then have control over the cookie, uh, which is very powerful today because the cookie is still uh, the 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 major technological one of the major technological components of ad tracking networks today and if you don't want to be part of those you can just turn your third party cookies off in your browser settings you can clear them after every setting you can do a lot of things to make your presence um, more anonymous so how how do you see the future of those third party cookies because um, they've received some very bad press and people are becoming more aware of those yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult overall technological problem to solve because the cookie is only one of many ways in which tracking could happen today. The, the web is a, is a much more complex technological beast than it was in the early 90s. And there are other methods for tracking people. Uh, fingerprinting is, is one of them and uh, domain spoofing and various other methods that people can use for tracking. The benefit of the cookie is that it's the devil you know and you have control over it. Um, so if you if if the techno if the solution is simply to move from uh, is to just disable cookies, the advertising networks will all move to something else, which you will not have control over. Uh, if you're if fingerprinting is the method in which they are tracking you, you have no control over that at all. Um, and there are various other methods that you would have no control over. So. I would advocate that the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Uh, that, and if you want to solve this problem, if we think that ad tracking is a bad idea, then we should solve this by saying ad tracking is not a legal mechanism um, within our country. Um, and that's essentially what the European Union is doing. Uh, they're, they're requiring that the use of cookies be, um, be explicit. And so the user has to agree up front that they accept that cookies will be used and that their use of cookies will be used for various different things. Now that has become onerous because every website you go to now asks you, do you like cookies and how do you want them to be used? And that's become kind of annoying. It would be better if we, if we, if we like that style solution that we come up with something that's more automated, like we tell our browser, yes, we want to allow this type of cookie, but not this other type of cookie. And then that would be communicated to the, to the site and we could stop clicking on those annoying cookie banners. So we've also um, kind of shifted slightly, Lou, um, if I'm not incorrect, from this idea of public bakeries almost, right, to private bakeries. And we're now we're seeing companies like Apple kind of walling off their data. Um, sorry, walling off the data that they collect. Do you see this as a win for us, the consumer, or is this going to turn into a bigger issue for us in the future? Well, there, the, each of these would be a more subtle issue to, to tie into, but um, the idea of, of selling, um, uh, selling, selling user data is a, is a dangerous one, especially since as technology improves and, um, and our ability to use um, um, artificial intelligence and other things to find uh, correlations in data, we oftentimes end up leaking more information than we thought we did. And so companies oftentimes try to anonymize their data uh, before selling it. But um, researchers have shown that um, even, uh, even moderate attempts to anonymize data can often be overcome by using uh, correlation data to actually 
you know, narrow it back down to an individual user. So whenever, whenever a company um, is selling your user data as its primary means of, of revenue, that is a, a potentially dangerous issue, depending on what type of data they put out there and whether that data can be then used against you. Most people, it's not an issue, but if you happen to be <clears throat> a, uh, you know, maybe a minor celebrity or something <laughs> where you didn't realize that the data you had, it could be you exploited against you. And then now, now people can find your home address or something like that. And that, that can actually be a, a real problem uh, for people. So um, certainly companies who make a real product, especially hardware, you should expect that they would not sell your data to somebody else in a way that would compromise your own um, your your own privacy. Um, it is more difficult for a company that is really only about um, you know uh, online data. So uh, Facebook, for instance, has a little bit more of a difficult problem because they don't have a physical product that you're buying. They're they're you're the product, in, in, essentially, um, and so they have a, they have a more difficult. Um, a little more difficult uh, time f figuring out how to how to kind of walk the narrow path without re uh, without revealing private data. And um, first off, I, I need to thank the audience for that question. Um, thank you very much. So, um, Lou, I'm going to move away from Twitties for a moment, and I'm going to jump into a happier time, the '90s. <laughs> um, although this is when Twitties before happened, the crash, right? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, but. Um, that actually brings me nicely into the question. The 90s were a time of boom for, for the web, right? And I kind of want to understand what Netscape's role was in that web revolution and what were the major contributions that you as a founding engineer kind of had on Netscape on the boom of the web. Yeah, so uh, our goal uh, at, at, at the foundation of Netscape was to take the web from this very document focused, you know, you can, you can, you can pull content in and absorb it into a more application focused world. So our goal was to, to be able to write any application that you could imagine that you run on your desktop. So whether it be, uh, you know, a spreadsheet program, a word processor, um, a game, um, <clears throat> solitaire, whatever, whatever you can think of, we wanted that to be able to run in the browser. And the, the reason for that is that the browser represents a fully cross-platform, cross-device uh, uh, ecosystem so that you could write it once and then everyone could use it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and we, we made a tremendous progress there. We ended up having a, this long drawn out battle with Microsoft that we ended up losing. Um, and then Microsoft tried to like really kill the web for a long time, but they couldn't. Um, and then, um, so I, I kind of think of the uh, the 90s, uh, so this was 94 to 98, in which Netscape had this small opportunity to take the web from this document management thing into an application development environment. And we got a, pretty far, but not far enough that you could really build any application. And then Microsoft came in and kind of think of that as the the, the middle ages where nothing happens, <laughs> the, the dark period in which uh, there was no innovation on the web uh, because Internet Explorer took over and Microsoft said, we're not we're not adding anything. We are just locked this down. Sorry, <laughs> you're not welcome here. But we had done enough that people started building applications. Uh, and even on even on Internet Explorer, they were able to build an application because Internet Explorer was compatible with, uh, with Netscape. Um, and then eventually, the uh, the open source community came back. Mozilla, which was an offshoot of Netscape, uh, built Firefox, and it became popular again. And then uh, Google came out with Chrome, and Apple came out with Safari, and all of these companies started moving the application development environment of the web forward. So fixing a lot of the broken parts, adding new features that allowed you to do, um, you know, a, a much more had a lot more customization and control of the environment. Um, made the performance better, so you can actually run, like, you can even run Doom in the in the browser these days. Like it's pretty amazing, and that kind of completed the puzzle. And now the web is it's not it's not a complete application development environment. Uh, I'll I'll tell you when you know well, when we know when when we won is when web applications <clears throat> have exactly the same power as an app on your phone, and you don't care whether it's a web app or a downloaded app. 
And in fact, once that happens, I would predict that all downloaded apps go away because the web browser is just, you know, it's it's way easier. There's less distribution friction and everything else. So it it it's it's a better it's a better mechanism. So it, it sounds like you were very welcoming of all these new players and all these new entrants into into the space. Yes. So I'm I have been and I continue to be a strong advocate of open standards and open source software. Uh, open standards allow everyone to play, and it causes uh, an innovation. Uh, a, 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 a strong and fast innovation cycle. Uh, when when a, a single company has proprietary control over something, they tend to get fat, dumb, and lazy. <laughs> they, they get all this revenue and they have, no longer have a reason to invest. They, they simply start uh, you know, rent seeking and they stop the innovation cycle. But when everyone controls the technology and, and there are multiple competitors in the space, that's good economics, there's many browsers that are all competing, they will all advance at a much faster rate and we all win when that happens. Yeah, it's a very common kind of um, issue with innovation. They, one of the key innovation traps, overfunding, it's, um, et cetera, right? All those um, elements that enabled you to be nimble and um, find those parts kind of evaporate and disappear. And all of a sudden you kind of rely on building moats rather than pushing ideas forward. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk about hopefully another happy time, and that is today. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. so I, I kind of want to know what keeps you busy today. Well, a, a little bit of a lot of things, I would say. Uh, so, um, you know, Netscape gave me a lot of opportunities. Uh, it, it, uh, I would say I was very, very lucky to be working on a, on a, on a project that had worldwide appeal. Um, and then to be able to be part of a company that, uh, at least in the short term, was very successful. We we didn't end up with a wonderful exit, but uh, we we had our we had, certainly had our fifteen minutes of fame, uh, and and uh, really helped move the world forward in, in that time. And I'm very proud of what we accomplished. Since then, I I I have continued to enjoy startups. It is a it is a incredibly focused. Uh, difficult but fun way of working where you're, you you get to pull in uh, a, a small group of really smart people uh, who become your close friends and you know frenemies at times as, as we have arguments and it's just it's very intense uh, and uh, I find that incredibly fun uh, the intellectual stimulation and the 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 feeling of accomplishment as you create something from nothing is uh, is it's hard to describe. I really enjoy it. So I'm working on my fifth startup now uh, in the aviation space. We're called Jet Insight, uh, and uh, and then I do a lot of other things. I'm a I'm a musician, a part-time musician. So I'm a drummer and I spend a lot of time practicing and performing. Um, I do a few podcasts like this and to try to stay relevant in technology space. <laughs> uh, but mostly, I'm known for all the things I did 20 years ago, which is which is okay. It's better than being known for nothing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I love to enjoy the outdoors. I am a big skier and mountain biker and, and other things And I have a family and, uh, you know, spend a lot of time with kids. So I uh, try to keep a, a balanced life, uh, and, uh, still keep my toe in the technology world and, and, and just stay as busy as possible because I, I love being busy. So how, how do you find innovating today compared to innovating in the nineties? Yeah. So as a, um, as a. A software architect and engineer, things today are a lot easier uh, to to at least create the initial version. So, uh, if you can think about if, you know cast your thoughts back to the '90s or early 2000s, if you wanted to create a new idea on the internet, you had to you had to be an expert in many different fields because you literally had to put put up your own data center area if you wanted to have a server. You couldn't just rent. Uh, you know, space in somebody else's uh, you know, uh, on somebody else's computer. You actually had to buy physical space in a data center, build a computer, put an operating system on it, manage it yourself, install your servers, and then pl plug it in. Have internet connectivity, all those sorts of things. You had to be an expert on you know routing protocols on on whatever operating system it was. You had to install all this stuff, all the chain all the way down, and then you had to build your software from scratch uh, with a lot fewer tools. Today, all that stuff is like literally automated. So you could go onto a service like Heroku and 
have all of your uh, infrastructure taken care of and they just hand you a machine and they go even further than that is like all you have to do is create an application in, in almost any language like like ruby java uh c plus you know i don't know why you do that anymore uh you know, any of these simple scripting language and and simply deploy it and you're on the web it's ridiculously easy so in an hour i could put up an idea whereas before it would take months even if i was highly motivated had all that expertise and then you have all these open source projects which are essentially Lego blocks to create your next application. And if you're if you're, you can be smart and judicious about picking right, the right Lego blocks, you can figure out a new business application or consumer application and do a prototype of this in in a very short period of time. And, uh, and so we have seen a, a very different world in terms of the founding uh, and and funding of of startups now versus. 10 or 15 years ago. Nowadays, it's expected that when you go out to fundraise, you already have built some sort of prototype that you can show off. And then uh, usually you'll raise a very small amount of money just to go out and build this provable system that you can sell at that point, because you can generally do that in three months. Whereas the, the, the product life cycles back in the 90s, where it took a year to build an application. <laughs> And nowadays, we release our we release our app every week or every two weeks, depending on, on on the companies. And some companies actually release their app every single day. Right? It's 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 really cool to be able to do that. The software tools have improved, the quality tools have improved, so things so, are much better. So we have an, a, a question from the audience, which I think is very relevant as well now. So you've obviously learned a lot over the years. So if you could go back and speak to your younger self, or go back in time. Is there anything that you would do differently? Um, gosh, I would say go buy Google stock or something. Probably. Rename <laughs> <laughs> um, Netscape to Google, right? Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a it is a good question. Um, I, I you know I, I guess it would depend on how long I have to discuss with my with my former self. <laughs> if I only had one message, it would be just buy Google. Uh, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, yeah, I, 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 there, there are things I couldn't do today that I could do back then. Like the the pure energy and focus I had to work on a problem, uh, actually, I think were better when I was younger. <laughs> like I, I think back and like I would work, uh, I would work seventeen or eighteen hours a day and sleep like four hours back at Netscape, and I, I know I couldn't do that anymore. So. I, I would, I would, uh, you know, I do have these ideas of time travel, and I just think I would totally screw up my younger self if I did send any <laughs> messages. Uh, uh, but I, I don't think that's the purpose of the question. That's getting very metaphysical there. Um, I would, I would say um, to anyone who wants to be successful is um, when you have an idea, just get up off the couch and and try it out, right? And if if you if you lose interest in it after a couple of days, that's totally fine. But the way we find our passions and the way we find actually interesting business ideas or things that turn into businesses, because many of the things that we we do accidentally turn into great businesses, is we just start doing them and we develop a passion for it and we discover things that actually turn discover things about the the space that turn into opportunities. And it's just the doing of these things that actually enables them. And to it, to have the self confidence that you can just do it uh, right from the start. I, I, when I when I started programming links, I literally had no idea what I was doing. I was working in a language that I had zero knowledge of, and I couldn't just go on the internet and search. Like there was no Google back then. Uh, by Google, by the way. Uh, so uh, I I was just trying to figure it out. I had no if I had stopped and rationally thought about what I was doing. I was like, this is ridiculous. You can't do this. You don't know anything about this language. You don't, you're not a programmer, but I just, I, I, I just started doing it. And I, I think that's a personality trait about me that maybe has enabled me to be successful is that I, I don't have any fear of just trying to do things. I, I would, if I was in front of an audience, I, I wouldn't want to be doing this in front of a live studio audience, but there's no harm in just trying something out. Like if, um, uh, I, I, can't, I can't think of any particular examples right now, but if I if I think of something, you know, like if I I, I rewired my whole house at, at one point because I was sick of all the light switches and everything. I had no idea what I was doing, but I, I actually had Google this time, so I just went on and read some YouTube, uh, watched some YouTube videos of how to rewire circuits. 
don't do this in Europe, by the way, because that's 220. But in 110, uh, you know, you can learn and you can be safe. But that's just another example is just just start trying it out. And if it turns out to be too difficult or you, you don't care, uh, move on to something else. And if you keep doing this, you will eventually find something that that uh, turns into something profitable. And that's how I kind of ended up in five different companies is just working on things. And like, oh, this is really interesting. I want to pursue this and, and, and working on that. And I, I would also add, Lou, I've seen some of your haircuts from back in the day. So if you could possibly <laughs> advise your younger self, I'm sure that would be quite high on the list, right? That would be that would be good, yes. <laughs> so I'm 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 gonna ask my personal question here, which has always fascinated me, Lou, um, about your approach. So you, um I know that you have a tendency to favor an engineer and founding team. And as a very worried strategist, um, I want to understand why do you think um, this is the right approach? Well, it it is different in different industries. So in in software focused industries, <laughs> in very software focused industries, there is it, there is a strong correlation between successful companies and and founders who are engineers who can build stuff. Right now, there's oftentimes a partnership between um, someone who's really good at technology and who's also good at, at the other person who's who's probably better at business. So um, Larry and Sergey, for instance, at at Google, one was uh, they're both both very nerdy, <laughs> like they they knew their stuff. They're both uh, doctorates in computer science, but one had a strong interest in business and the other was you know really you know a deep passion for the technology. And they worked really well together and they built a great business. And there's many other examples of that. But the 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 one of the reasons why this works so well as uh, have founding teams who are very technical is that in the early days, at least in the first year, for instance, you have um, you have a very small team to build a product which is very difficult to build, and you will really want everyone to be in on it. And you also want <clears throat> the founders to be dog fooding that product like they need to be in that product in every single way and making it the best it can possibly be and if you're a a business type ceo you probably spend most of that first year not doing a whole lot because you don't understand the product there's no business deals to be done there you can't sell the product yet i um you know, there, there certainly are exceptions to this rule and a a person who is a great salesperson might um might have incredible in, uh, perspective on the particular industry that they are selling into and can be an incredible product resource for the engineers who are building it. And there are certainly other companies who have built everything off source uh, or outsourced and then become successful, although that, that has its own dangers. Um, but the in Silicon Valley, there is a there's also somewhat of a myth around the technical founder and and uh, VCs love to love to fund these these kind of things. So there's just a lot of 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 tailwind around uh, founding a company as a technical co-founder uh, because you can go build it yourself. You, you're in it all the way. You understand the product really well. You don't uh, you don't let other people to guide your your uh, your future. You're really in there and you're making it happen. And then when you go out to sell it, you know the product better than anybody. Um, so it just works really well for software businesses. Not necessarily the best thing to do if you're you know starting a know, a, uh, a flower business or something else. Although in, in most businesses, in most small businesses, the the owner needs to be really, really well-versed in what they're selling. So if you're going to run a flower shop, you better know flowers really well. If you're going to be a restaurateur, it's not a bad idea to be a good chef, uh, all these things. So uh, certainly having that domain knowledge is good. So um, you've made it very difficult for me to win arguments with my engineering team tomorrow. So thank you, Lou, for that. So. Uh... <laughs> I would like to switch up our um, final question slightly. There's a wonderful Wait, I, one. I have, I have an engineering joke for you. Go for uh, it. Okay. How many engineers does it take to change a light bulb? I, I would like to say one. Yes, it's just <laughs> one, uh, but not in the way you're thinking. The engineer holds a light bulb and the world re revolves around him. <laughs> okay, good. That gives me something to come back with. Thank I, you do, I knew you would understand that. Great. that Great. <laughs> so um, my um, our final question, Lou, I've got a wonderful one from the audience here, um, from Agnieszka. And she would like to know, as we all would, um, what waits next in the tech industry? Do you have any predictions or maybe something that you are dreaming of, something you would love to see? 
Yeah, I, I get this question a lot. Everybody wants to know the future. <laughs> you want to buy the, the next Google stock, right? Right, <laughs> yes. yes. Buy Google. Uh, sorry, that, that doesn't work now because it's already been bought. Uh, so uh, I, I think that people who try to predict the future are generally almost always wrong. So I'm not going to be one of those. Uh, but I would say that there are some there are some signs that you can look for when when trying to figure out what the next thing will be be in the near term, right? It's really, really hard to say what will be what will be important 20 years from now because innovation has been accelerating, i.e. that the the number of innovations every year goes up. And it's not exponential, but it's a it's an interesting curve. So we are we are innovating faster today than we were in the 90s. And it's because the things we build, faster computers, more networking, all the things that are the tools of innovation are getting faster. Um, and you know, at some point, we might have artificial intelligence that are, are helping us innovate even faster. Um, but we we can we can make some um, predictions about what might take off in the next few years. And I think of it a little bit differently than most. I think of it as what things are being held back by friction. So um, there's a whole bunch of things that we uh, that are that are new innovations in the last five years. Things like uh, Uber and Lyft and uh, 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 food delivery apps and other things that all of those all of those industries are essentially capable of existing ten or fifteen years ago, uh, but why didn't they? And the it, my theory on why they didn't is that there was there was just enough friction in the technology to stop them from being able to take off, and when it, something takes off because it creates a you know a, a feed a tight feedback loop where it, you know it gets it it builds upon itself and uh so 10 10 years ago uh you know our iPhones and our Android phones were way slower had way worse interfaces didn't have good GPS and all these uh, all these other things so that it was if you wanted to create an Uber back then you you had all this friction around the fact that well maybe the user had a GPS on their phone maybe they didn't could they actually have you know enough power to run this app? Um, and did did all the drivers have a smartphone? Because not everybody had a smartphone. And so as soon as everyone got a smartphone that had GPS in it, it removed the friction from the system that allowed these sorts of apps to happen. And and so we will see this in other areas. So um, right now we're seeing uh, the miniaturization miniaturization of the phone technology, and it's migrating into watches and other things like that, such that now these things are with us, not just when we're in the car or on a you know, regular day, they're, they're sleeping with us. They're, they're on us, uh, they're with us on a run. And so there's going to be a whole broad class of applications that will now be able to take advantage of the, of the lack of friction um, that this creates. And there'll be other technologies like this. Um, and so those are the, those are the things where I think you'll have these innovation spikes around um, the the technology just becomes ubiquitous enough that it it you know it it releases all these other types of apps and then you know once we had Uber it was kind of obvious that um, you would get things like food uh, uh, um, uh, outsourced food delivery apps because you know Uber isn't just about GPS on your phone it's also about um, uh, uh, the uh, the gig economy and those sorts of things and the gig gig economy is also obviously enabled by the ubiquitous nature of mobile mobile phones and e-commerce on the on the phone. So all these all these things happen. So I'm not going to make any predictions about particular technologies that are taking off, but I would say look into those areas as as technology changes just a little bit, it gets under the friction level and allows new applications and um, and and uh, business types to be created. So just to focus on that very last question uh, part of the question not a prediction of the future, but more what would Lou dream of? What would be the ideal kind of innovation for you, Lou? Is there something that is very unreachable right now, but is something that you would love to see? Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, there, there's some products that have, have tried already, and I think we're at the, the early ages of this. Is um, It reminds me a little bit of like the tablet age, but the uh, 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 artificial reality, but augmented reality, really the, the one that I, I think is, is interesting. 
So uh, Google Glass was the, the very first <laughs> well-known implementation of this. So um, if we go back into the 90s um, and look at companies that tried to do tablets back in the day, there was pen computing and um, there was uh, Magic Leap, or I can't remember, uh, General yeah, Magic. Magic Leap, yeah. um, there's all these companies that tried to do tablets and they all had like, really good ideas they had they had the full vision of the tablet in their head but the, this was a problem of friction they didn't have batteries that could last long enough they didn't have thin enough computers they didn't have powerful enough computers and they also lacked the um the screen technology that had enough resolution to do it so they were it, you could build a, a big tablet with a giant battery that was about three inches thick and weighed about 14 pounds and had like 30 minute battery life and it kind of understood your writing but none of that was good enough for the consumer. And it wasn't until the iPad came out with a good battery technology, you know, based on lithium polymer batteries, based on, on really thin mobile chips uh, that were initially done for phones with screens that were reasonably priced because phones had made screens and, and LCD screens for the, all these things had just lowered their friction level enough that, that pa a tablet computing finally took off. Uh, well, uh, our, uh, augmented reality will probably be like that too. So right now, um, if you <laughs> Google Glass, if you remember it, 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 this thing that didn't work very well, and it, it, there's all these technologies that are almost there, like the ability to project an image yeah. onto your glasses. Once all those things get there, this technology is going to take off, and it's going to be really, really interesting in our everyday life. Like um, one of my biggest problems is I have a really hard time remembering everybody's name, and it, my my absolute dream app would be I'm wearing these glasses and every person I meet, I know their full name, all their children's names, all those things that just doesn't come to my mind right away. And I feel really embarrassed about. But is that all thanks to the cookie that you would have access to all their data? No, <laughs> no, that because <that'd> be... <laughs> cookies don't leak that data. By okay. the way. <laughs> Cool. Um, so, Lou, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, and I would like to thank the audience as well, and especially for your questions. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, and we have absolutely really enjoyed telling your story, Lou. So um, we will be in contact, and we will be talking a lot more. So if you guys have any more follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us, and we will try our best to put them forward to Lou. So uh, thank you very much everyone for joining yeah. us today thank you for having me i'll work on my haircut <laughs>